Uh, so, yeah, I'm Rufus White. I'm the Native Instruments Product Specialist for the island. Um, so, basically, that entails looking after all the artists that we have, so giving them any trainings and also technical support as well. So, I know Tractor inside out. So, just before we begin, uh, how many of you use Tractor in your live performances already? Sometimes, not always. Okay, cool. Uh, we've got a few that use it all the time. Right, okay. So we've got a nice kind of cross-section between the lot. Okay, so a bit of background about Tractor. Um, Tractor's over 10 years old now, which is amazing to think back on because I've been using it since the very first version. Uh, it's, uh, it's now become the most established and respected DJ software on the market. Um, it initially gained recognition when um, Native Instruments teamed up with Stanton to uh, integrate their final scratch technology so that they could have the first digital vinyl system on the market. Uh, each iteration through those over 10 years has uh, gained more and more features and we're now at a point where it's pretty reliable for gig use. I mean, I've not had any crashes or any problems throughout the whole time that I've been using it. Um, for me, I think the best thing about Tractor is the versatility that you've got with it. Uh, it really bends to fit how you work rather than the other way around. So if, for example, I turn up to a booth and they've not got enough space for my entire setup here, I can slim that down by however much I need to and still keep most of the features that we've got there. Um, so you can set Tractor up in quite a few different ways. Uh, you can have it with just the laptop and a sound card and just use the mixer as your output or you can use it with vinyl CD with time code or one of the newer setups is using the CDJs with the HID mode which basically means that you're connecting up the CDJ as a controller rather than using it with time code you see all of your track information on the screen and obviously the waveform and uh, things like that on the screen as well which is really really useful a lot of guys are actually starting to use that now Super easy setup as well. Uh, then you've got a laptop with a full controller like the S4 here, uh, which is my preferred setup because it's kind of like the, the native tractor setup. You know, you're getting everything basically the, the way that the, the guys at Native designed it. Uh, and then you've got tractor with pretty much any other MIDI controller as well. Anything that can transmit MIDI into your laptop, you can use it with tractor. So even things like Nintendo Wiimotes I've seen people use, you know, if you can get a MIDI signal into the computer, you can use it with Tractor. Um, so it looks like we've got some guys who are kind of quite expert on Tractor already. And how, how many have not used Tractor at all? A couple. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go right from the very basics with Tractor, okay? Um, so what we'll do is we'll just kind of go through the different sections of the software here. If it's looking a bit grainy here, you might want to have a look at the screen over at the side as well. Okay, so I've just got this set up in a two deck setup right now. You can have up to four decks and four effects as well. And those decks can either be normal track decks, so you can just play normal tracks from them, or they can be remix decks as well. Um, and then you can also have from two to four effects decks as well, okay? So those effects can be rooted from any deck into any effect. We'll get onto that in a little bit later, okay? So first, let's just have a quick look at the deck section here, okay? So we've got full waveform for the track, so, and then you can see the zoomed out view along the bottom as well. You can have up to eight cue points per track. That's what these sections here are. Uh, and then you've got looping controls and beat grid, grid controls below as well. Um, so then in the middle, normally if I just set this up with the S4 setup, so you can see we've got the mixer section there in the middle, pretty much mirrors what you're used to on a standard club mixer. Um, you've got a couple of extra controls as well, for ex example the uh, effects routing controls here you can't see very well. Um, and also the key controls. Um, so pretty standard mixer setup. I mean, it's not always necessary to have that on screen, especially if you've got a full hardware controller like this. Um, but it's pretty versatile in that you can show and hide any of those sections if you want to. 
Um, then we've got the loop section underneath, so you can loop anywhere from 0.32 of a beat all the way up to 32 beats, uh, and you can even do it manually as well. And then also we've got uh, the effects section at the top here, so you've got any one of about 24 different effects to choose from with full control over all the parameters for the effects. And you can also set those into a, what's called a grouped mode as well. So you can actually have three effects per slot if you want. So a total of 12 effects on top of each other if you want, if you want to get that crazy. Personally, that's a little bit <laughs> too out there for me. Um, I stick with four effects normally. Um, and then in the middle here at the top, we've got a loop recorder as well. So that can actually record live performances from any, either any of the decks or an input into something from like a, a CDJ or a microphone. Um, and also you can choose to do it from your headphone queue as well. So that's the basic tractor interface. We've got underneath here as well, the browser, which is showing playlists on the left and your actual tracks on the right. So it makes it super easy to search through all your tracks, even if you've got like 20,000 like I have here. Um, just a quick note, I know some of you are maybe a little bit skeptical of Tractor just because you're thinking, oh, I've got to beat grid everything, I've got to beat sync everything, I don't have to beat match manually. I, I've heard it before, you know. It's, it's one of those things. If you want to beat sync by ear, then there's nothing stopping you doing that. You know, you can turn the sync off completely. If you want to do four decks by ear, you can be my guest personally. <laughs> I'd rather not do that. Um, uh, I, there's, uh, there's nothing stopping me from doing that if I want to, but uh, it gets a little bit tricky once you start involving more than three decks, I find. Um, but uh, beat gridding is something that's really important and central to Tractor in terms of it's a good idea to beat grid every single one of your tracks just so that Tractor knows how to sync the effects to it, if nothing else. Uh, if you do use effects a lot, then you, know, you want those effects to be in time with what you're playing. Um, so we'll go through kind of setting up beat grids for each of the individual tracks a bit later on. Um, also, the, one of the other good things about Tractor is the fact that if there's something that you don't like about any of the controls that are on here, you can change them to whatever you want. So any of the features that Tractor supports, if I wanted to map effects onto my jog dials, for example, if I find that I wasn't using my jog dials very much and it'd be cool to have an effect on there instead, I could map that up, no problem. You know, you can change anything to suit your workflow. So that's, that's one of the really cool things. And I've got a couple of little um, mappings that I've put onto this, for example. So I don't use the gain knobs very much because Tractor's also a game is, it's pretty good, I find. It's very rare that I have to adjust the gain on a track. So I found that if I put shift and then turn the gain knob at the top of the uh, mixer there, it means that I can change the key of the track independent from the tempo. So I'm not worried about the key of the track. I can just do that by ear. Get every, every track in key with every track that I'm playing. I'm not limiting which tracks I'm playing just because they're in key or they're out of key. You know, I can play any track and make it be in key. Um, let's just go through the sections on the S4 here and how they relate to the sections in the software. So in the middle here, you've got a standard mixer section. So you've got four channels. Weirdly, well, it might seem weirdly at first, um, but it does actually make sense if you think about it. You've got the two inner ones here. This is deck A and deck B. And then on the outside, you've got C and D. Uh, a lot of people seem to have problems getting their head around that when they uh, first see that, and I can kind of understand why, uh, but it does make sense. Um, deck A and C, if you look at the software, they're above each other. So it's good to have those two things on the left, and then we've got B and D on the right, so they obviously relate to the right-hand decks on the software as well. So it does kind of make sense, but if you're coming to it from a traditional mixer point of view, I can see how that's a little bit weird. Uh, at the top, we have the effects sections here and here. So we've got two effects sections on the S4. And then we'll go into the effects sections on the X1 as well in a second. Um, so as I said, you can have either one or three effects in each one. Okay. So up here, you've got a dry and wet knob. And then you've either got the three parameter knobs for the effect. Or you've got those as three separate effects. 
and each one will control just the one main parameter for that effect. Okay. Uh, just below the gain knobs here, you can see we've got some little lights, so they choose the routing for the effects. So if I wanted to put dec A into my delay on the left hand side here, for example, I can press number one there, and if I wanted to put dec B into my beat slicer that I've got over on the right hand side, I can turn off one there, and so I've got A over to the delay, and B over to the beat slicer. So, and if I wanted to swap those around, it's pretty easy, I've just got those controls at the top there. Okay. In the middle, we've got the, the browse section. Okay, so this relates to the browser at the bottom. So it's kind of like the browse knob on the CDJs. I can browse up and down through my tracks, or if I want, I can go through my playlists on the left-hand side, see all my tracks with the artwork there. Okay, and if I use the one on the right-hand side, I can even go through my favorites, which is this bar along the middle here. So, and then I can choose the track just by pressing browse and it'll load into the deck. Uh, again, that's actually a, a custom mapping that I've got on mine. Um, it doesn't normally load it into two decks, it loads it into the first stop deck, okay? So I don't have to worry about which one I'm putting it in. I can just press browse, it's loaded up straight away there for me. Um, in the middle here, we've got obviously the EQs for the filters, standard filters here. And then we've got the loop recorder in the middle here. So that relates to the one at the top of the screen. Um, so I can record live performances and things like that from there. It's actually also pretty interesting. You can hook a foot switch into that as well. So you can just stamp your foot, start a loop recording, and then it'll actually record loops over the top. So you can do one layer, record another layer over the top, and it will keep everything in time as you play. Um, OK, so then we've got on the right hand side and the left hand side here we've got the deck section so again you can probably work out a lot of these controls you've got the jog dials which are pretty nice to feel actually um, they're touch sensitive so you can scratch with them or just pitch bend with them uh, load buttons to load the tracks into the deck and then we've got really interesting loop section below here um, now the looping doesn't work in too much of a similar way to the pioneer stuff You've actually got a knob here which you can change how many beats you want to have your loop. And then as soon as you've hit that button, that's your loop. 16 beats there, 8 beats. And I can change that loop size as I'm doing it as well. OK. And then on this side, we've got the loop move section. So if I'm playing a track, let's just start something off here. OK. So this is something that would be very difficult to do with a, a standard CDJ setup, let's say. Okay, If I want to move that loop throughout my track, I've got a knob on this side, and I can just move it throughout the track. So I'm sure you're already thinking in your head, like, you know, that's actually pretty useful, you know. Really useful for me in that, like, if I'm messing about with effects during a breakdown, for example, let's just come out of that loop and go to the breakdown here. Okay. Sometimes you're messing about with effects, you know, you miss bringing your track back in, you know, I meant to start it there. So I could actually start it eight beats late, shift it to eight beats on here. Okay. Okay. And then shift it eight beats into the track so that my phases are still matched up with how they should be. Okay. And then if I want to do manual controls, I can actually use those here as well. So if I wanted to make a loop of three beats or five beats or whatever, I can still do that if I want. Okay. So let's just shut that up. Okay, then we've got cue points underneath there. So uh, as I said before, I've got eight different cue points. Um, so usually I use all eight cue points throughout my track and it's really good because um, you can actually quantize those cue points so that if I've got something beat matched there, I can actually skip through the track. I don't know if you can see on this screen here. So I'm going to jump to 2.3 here. And you can hear everything stays in time really nicely. So then underneath there, we've got our transport controls. So play, cue, sync, and then the shift button. 
shift button just basically unlocks all the secondary functions of the controller. Um, we don't really need to know too much about them just for this purposes of this tutorial, but uh, we can definitely go into those in the one-on-one -on -one sessions later on if we want, okay? Um, so then got crossfader, tempo controls, pretty standard for a DJ setup. Then you've got your flux button across here as well. So that's basically like the slip mode on the CDJs, okay? Does everybody understand the slip mode on the CDJs? Or is everybody not really not knowing what that is? I'm kind of getting blank looks. <laughs> okay, so the slip mode, uh, or the flux mode in this case, basically allows me to use the cue points and the loops, and even the jog dials as well. And as soon as I let go of those controls, it's gonna snap back to where it would have been in the track had I not used that control. So maybe it's a little bit easier if I demonstrate that. So I'm in this breakdown here, okay? Now normally if I loop something up, it's obviously just gonna hit that loop and it's gonna continue on until I come out of that loop again, okay? If, on the other hand, I've got flux mode engaged, then I have to hold that loop control in, okay? And you'll see in a second, the little line moving off into the distance. It's not very clear on here. There's a little blue line moving further along into the track. So that's where I would have been had I not looped the track, okay? So as soon as I let go of that loop control now, it's gonna jump back to where it would have been, okay? So this is actually really, really useful in certain situations, you know, and I can even use the jog dials, for example. I'm not a scratch DJ, but it'll still jump back into time. So let's just try that with another track play in there, okay? So I'm not gonna load that one because it's got a bunch of vocals. Let's load this one here. Okay, so I'm gonna loop that up. I'm gonna have 16 beats. Okay. So let's just put this one through delay. As soon as I let go, it jumps back to where it would have been. Okay. So some really nice features there that I'm sure you're kind of cooking over in your head what you can do with those. I, obviously I, I don't use the CDJs too much. Uh, I'm much more used to the uh, native instrument stuff. Um, for me, I use flux mode every once in a while. For, for dance music DJs, I don't think it's such a big feature, you know? For scratch DJs, I can see some really good use cases for that. But for electronic DJs, perhaps not so much. I have seen a couple of people use it really well. Carl Cox uses that a lot. Uh, in conjunction with the, the, it's kind of like if I put the loop into less than a beat here, okay? Now normally if you have your loop controls less than a beat, then Tractor's not gonna be able to keep those tracks beat synced, okay? Whereas if I have the flux mode on, I can keep those tracks beat synced as soon as I let go of that loop control. So let's just start again with this track, okay? So I've got this track playing here, okay? And let's just put this one in. Okay, so let's say I want to make like a little roll out of this bit here. Okay, so I've got my flux mode engaged. Okay, and now I can roll it. And as soon as I let go, it's still gonna be in time. Now normally if you didn't have the flux mode engaged and I did the same thing, things start to unravel pretty quickly, okay? Now you can see on this track here, this is my phase meter, the little orange flashing bar here. So that's telling me how out of time I am. So because I'm doing it by half a beat, it's going half a beat out of time every time it loops, okay? If I do it less than half a beat, you can see it going all over the place and spazzing out, okay? Now if I let go of that loop, it could be anywhere. Unless my timing is absolutely dead on, I'm not gonna be able to time that exactly. Okay, you can see it here, that's absolutely horrible. Okay. <laughs> it's been a while since I've messed up that badly. Um, so, <laughs> so if you've got the flux mode on, in that situation, that's, that's a really good use case for that, you know? Uh, again, as well, I sometimes do in the breakdowns, you know, I'll use one deck to kind of like 
scratch with the delay on or the reverb or something like that, you know, just make some really weird trippy sounds. Uh, again, if you've got the flux mode on, you know you can let go of the jog dial and it'll jump straight back into time again, okay? So there's a couple of use cases for you there. Uh, maybe that's something you can be thinking about. We've got something going on a little bit later on that that might be useful for, okay? Um, so that's a quick introduction to the whole of the tractor interface. We're going to go through a couple of the other controllers here as well, okay? So over this side, we've got the F1, okay? So this is to be used with what's called a remix deck, okay? So this is where things start getting interesting. Um, now the remix deck, I'm going to expand it just here so that you can see the full thing in all its grainy glory on this screen. Um, here we go. So what I've got here is I've got a sample pack with up to 64 samples that I can load all those samples at once into, okay? So those samples can be either loops or they can be one-shot samples. So I can use them to just add things from like a hi-hat or a drum beat behind what I'm doing. Or I can put individual drum sounds onto those pads and I can use them to tap out rhythms. I could put chords on there so I could actually make like a little melody line using them. The possibilities with this are pretty limitless I've found and I really, really enjoy using it in my set. The downside to this is that there's a lot of prep work involved, okay? And I know some people can't get their heads around that. Um, but if you do put the preparation into these remix decks, they are absolutely fantastic and they're a really good way of making your set, set stand out and be something really unique because you can literally take a track, take it apart and put it back together again. Um, so let's just go through the sections on the software and the sections on the hardware here, okay? So you can see what I've done here is I've turned this deck into one of the remix decks. Okay, so I have four channels within this remix deck and it's kind of like having Ableton inside Tractor. Uh, I don't know how many people use Ableton, quite a few. Okay, so the concept is very similar. Okay, you have four channels and from each channel, from each column here, you can have one sample or loop playing. Okay. So as soon as I choose another loop from that column, it's going to stop playing the one that it was before and it's going to start playing the next one, okay? So I hope you can kind of imagine this is where you've got to really think about what you're putting in each column, okay? So it's a good idea to have really good organization as soon as you start using these things because you wouldn't want, for example, let's say you had a bunch of vocals on this remix deck, okay? You wouldn't want two vocals crossing over each other, okay? So what I tend to do is I put all my vocal samples, loops, into one column so that I can only ever play one vocal at a time, okay? So, and then same thing. So normally the way that I organize it is I will have on my first channel, kicks, main beats of tracks. Second channel, I'll have my higher end stuff, so snares, hi-hats, Third channel, more synthy instrument types, you know, and then fourth channel, vocals, okay? Then at least I know that whatever I pick from each of those columns, it's going to be fairly uh, in one group, okay? So it's either going to be beats, top end, synth, or vocal, okay? Um, how you organize it is obviously up to you. Um, that's just a personal tip from me, okay? Um, so each of these samples is gonna stay in sync with whatever you're using from your decks, okay? So it's gonna pick up the tempo from your main track decks at the top here, and it's gonna keep all those loops in time, okay? So this is where things start getting really interesting. You can layer up whatever you want from this sample deck. And if you wanted to, you could even have two remix decks, three remix decks, four remix decks if you wanted. So you could actually be producing live on the fly. I know a few guys who once they've finished a track, they'll actually break it down into its component stems. And then when they're DJing, they actually perform that track live just using the samples. So it's, I find a really good compromise between the full live production that you can do with Ableton Live and actually feeling that you're DJing, which I, mean, I tried Ableton Live for a bit. I, I didn't feel like I was DJing with it. That was, that was my problem with it. It all felt, a little bit too clinical and not spontaneous enough. And 
I like to be able to do whatever I want, whenever I want to do it. You know, if I wanted to drop some random vocal over the top of stuff, what should be stopping me doing that? In Ableton, I found that I had to prepare every single thing that I wanted to do well in advance. So this is a good kind of compromise between the two. You know, you've, you've still got all the creative possibilities of having Ableton there, but you've also got the spontaneity of having Tractor and a DJ rig there. Okay, so with each of these samples, we can do quite a few different things with them. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn up my channel C there, which is the deck that we're using here. Um, I don't know if we can see the F1 on the screen. Can you guys see the F1? Yeah, yeah, yeah. we can see it. Okay, cool. So, we've got independent volume controls for each column here, okay? And then we've got an independent filter as well. So because this is coming through one of Tractor's normal decks, it means that I've even got an overall filter and EQ for that deck as well, okay? So, if we just start a beat from this one here, for example. Okay. And then what I'm gonna do, let's just stop that. So I've got my hi-hats on channel two there. And if I wanna just bring the kick up, the beat, I can filter just that section, okay? Okay, let's just put that down again. So then we've also got for each channel, we can choose whether we want that channel to be routed through the effects or not. So this is when things start getting really interesting. Once you've got four decks and they're all rooted into different effects and you've got individual sample channels as well rooted through the effects, you've really got to be thinking on your toes what's rooted where, you know, have I got this going through the delay? I've messed up quite a few times in my learning days having effects rooted to the wrong deck, I'm sure we all have at some point. Uh, it's something to really bear in mind when you start doing things at this level, that you've got to have some degree of organization, make sure that you've got a clear idea of which effects are on which banks and things like that. Okay, so um, we've got the individual grid of samples down here. So as I say, we can have up to 64 samples with 16 shown at any time, okay? So, and each one's got their own individual color. Again, you can use the colors to organize your samples, okay? So what I tend to do is, if I've sampled more than one thing from a particular track, I make those all, all those samples exactly the same color so that I can see that that sample goes with that sample, for example. Um, so we've got 16 samples there, and then we've got another 16 in four pages, and we can flip through them just using a knob there. Okay, and then at the bottom of that, we have the stop and mute button, okay? Again, as with most of Native Instruments gear, we've got a shift button here so that each button actually has a secondary function as well. Um, so if I wanted to actually stop those samples rather than just mute them, let's just put that channel up there, okay? So if I press this, without the shift button, it's just muting it. You can see it's dimmed the sample that's playing here. Okay, and again, if I do the same thing with the beat there, it's just dimmed that one, okay? But it's actually still playing in the background. So as soon as I let go of that mute, it's gonna be still playing in the background. It's just gonna start up again, okay? If I wanna actually stop those samples, I can hold down the shift button, same button, okay? So. Again, each function's got its own secondary function. It's actually a lot easier to see what each button does with its secondary function once you can see it there in the flesh because it's got it written underneath here what the shift button does with each one, okay? So, again, things like if I wanted to change the color, for example, I can use shift and then we've got reverse there. So I can choose which one I want to use and then just choose a color, okay? So with the samples we've got, a few different ways of using them. We've got looping, which is generally how I use mine. I just set up a whole bank of 64 loops or up to 64 loops and just use them like that. I know a lot of people who they'll use uh, one shots and stabs, things like that. So we can have either of the types of samples on there, okay? Uh, I can change between those. 
if I go onto the type button here and then I shift this to PL, which is play type, okay? So if it's green, it's a loop. And then if I press it, it turns to blue. I don't know if you can see that on there. Get my hand out of the way, maybe. So those are changing to one shots on the software. You can actually see the icon change there if we had a bit more resolution. Okay. Um, so, and then we've got things like reversing the sample. If I want to play that sample backwards, so I can hold down reverse. And then as soon as I let go of the button, it's going to start playing forward again, but from where it would have been, okay? So it's not like using the reverse switch on the CDJs where it's just going to start playing again from where it left off. It's actually going to keep exactly the same as the slip mode. If I hold down reverse, it's going to still be in time when I let go of reverse, okay? All right. And then we've got, uh, we can change the pitch of the samples. So pitch is on shift and type here, okay? So once we're in that mode, I can hold down which one I want to change, and I can change it by semitones, okay? Exactly. Okay, so it's still keeping it in time. The speed is staying exactly the same, but it's just changing by semitones. Okay. And then we've got things like the speed of it as well, and editing functions like I can copy things from one sample to another, okay? So I suppose at this point it might be a good idea to tell you how to actually sample onto this thing, because this is where the fun really starts happening, okay? So we've got a few different ways that we can get samples onto these pads, okay? The first way is we can sample a track that's playing live, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to find a page that's got a few blank slots on here, okay? And let's see if I have something in my collection that's not exactly dance music. Let's see. Bit of Bob Marley, maybe, okay? So this is a track that I've warped up in Ableton so that we have a nice solid beat grid throughout the track, okay? I reckon there's gotta be some loops in here that we can use to just kind of like make some electronic music a bit more interesting, okay? So let's just have a quick play through there. I'm just gonna turn this down a little bit. Okay. So we've got a nice little bit there at the start. So I'm thinking what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set that to 16 beats and I'm going to turn it into a loop, okay? So let's just see how well that loops. Let's see how that goes with, uh, with a beat behind it. Okay, that goes pretty well. So let's get that onto our sample pads then, okay? So because I've already turned this in, I've, I've turned my loop on for that deck, what I can do now is I go over to the F1, I press the capture button here, which is next to the, the loop knob, okay? So I'm going to press that, and if I hold it down, it's going to tell me which deck it's going to sample that from, okay? So I don't know if you can see on the screen there, it says CA, so that means it's going to sample from deck A, okay, which is the one that we want. So as I let go of that, it's already telling me that because I've got that loop set, it's going to be 16 beats long, okay? So now as soon as I press any one of these buttons that's blank, it's going to load that sample straight onto there, okay? So that's doing it while the track is actually stopped, okay? I can also do it while it's playing as well. The difference being that if I have a loop set beforehand, then it's going to capture the whole of the loop from the start of that loop, okay? Uh, regardless of where the little red line which shows your current position in the song is, okay? If I am playing the track, then it's going to take that sample from whatever point the needle is at when I press the button, okay? So let's just see what we've got on that slot now. 
Okay. We've still got that one playing, okay? So I'm gonna start playing the one that I've sampled when I press this, okay? Now I've still got it in capture mode, which is why it's sampling straight back onto that button again. So I've come out in capture mode by pressing that button now. Bit of a change of pace. Okay, so we've got that sample in its entirety, okay? Now let's just try the same thing with the track actually playing. Let's just stop that one. Okay. So if I'm in capture mode on the F1 here, okay, and I do it while the track is playing, it's just gonna grab that sample from wherever it is in the track at the moment, okay? So because I've got sync on and quantize on, it should snap it to the beat, but it's not always the best way of doing it. That I tend to find it's much better to set my loops up in advance, okay? Just so that you've got a lot more control over what you're taking, okay? So let's check that loop on here now. We've come out of capture mode. I'm gonna put that one up. So you see it's not quite caught right on the beat. Okay, so just something to bear in mind, it's usually a better idea to capture your loops beforehand. If you're playing your track and you want to do something in the moment, then it's obviously going to capture it in time with what you've got playing right now. But if you then come back to it and you, you, um, you start up track so you've saved that uh, set of samples and you're playing at a different um, tempo, then Things might be a little bit iffy if you don't do it right when uh, on the first piece of the bar or whatever, okay? So, yeah. Let's shut you, shut you up, Bob. Right. So, as I say, we've got four different channels there, so we can obviously have quite a lot of Sonic content on just one remix deck there. I know some guys that use two of these, you know, and obviously you've got a lot more creative possibilities than you even have with one. Um, so with the, uh, with the samples there, we've got a couple of controls up at the top here. We've got sync and we've got quantize, okay? You can probably work out what sync does. It just syncs that remix deck to what you're doing in your other decks, okay? Quantize is a little bit trickier to get your head around if you've not used it in your productions, perhaps. Uh, if I hold down the quantize button, We've got different settings here for the level of quantization, okay? So if I only wanted things to start at the start of every bar, then I can put my quantize on four beats, okay? So now it means that I can't play those samples out of phase, okay? I can't start the sample playing on, let's say, the second beat of the bar, okay? I can only ever start it on the first beat of the bar. Again, though, this is really important to set your beat grid up in advance on the tracks because otherwise Tractor doesn't know where the first beat of the bar is. It just makes a guess, okay? So let's just stop this deck here playing. Okay, I'm gonna go back to page one. And let's, just, let's see if we've got something a little bit different. Okay, so we've got some secondary functions for the pads themselves as well. If I hold down shift, you can see the grid shifts to orange, okay? So we've got some little markers down the side of the F1 here that tell me what each of those buttons do. Uh, so we've got key lock at the top. We've got effects, so I can choose whether I want to route that channel through my effects or not. I've got monitor. Now, monitor is only useful really if you're using Tractor's internal mixer, okay? If you're using Tractor through a Pioneer mixer or an external mixer, then the monitor doesn't become very useful because it's trying to send something out of a channel that Tractor doesn't have, okay? And then punch mode is actually a pretty interesting one. So punch mode's pretty fun, especially for kind of like breakbeat loops and things like that. Um, because what that does is instead of starting each sample from the beginning of the sample when I press the button, okay, it's actually going to start it from the point of the sample that it would have been in the last sample. It's, it's a bit difficult to explain, but perhaps, I don't know how clearly you can see the little red line on this first slot here, okay? 
So if I have punch mode on for that channel, okay, and I now choose another sample from that slot, you can see the red line's not going to change. Okay, it's just going to carry on from exactly where it left off. Okay, so it's not going to start the sample from the beginning. It's just going to carry on from where it was. So you can actually see, because I have the quantized turned on there, and it's set to a bar now, it's waiting until the next bar before it starts that next sample. Okay? So you can see it kind of flashing before it actually brings that sample in. Okay? So it's waiting until the next bar before it does that every time. And I can change that all the way down to 0.4 of a beat if I want. Personally, I prefer to have it on one beat. I know that I can pretty much hit those buttons within one beat, you know? That's within my skill set at least. So now, as soon as I press the button, it's just gonna snap it to the nearest beat. Okay, now you can hear some of my samples are a lot louder than others, okay? So we've gotta have a, a way to be able to adjust that whilst we're playing, okay? So the way to do that is, let's see this one now. This one's way too loud, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make it the same level as all the rest of them. Okay, so probably about there, eh? And then if I hold down shift and use my volume knob, let's just uh, open this deck out full so you can see the gain knob. There we go, okay. So we've got a gain knob here for the individual samples, okay? So, as I, let's put that down and do the same thing again. I can hold down shift and do it the other way. You can see that kind of shift around there. So, let's just check that against the other samples now. A little bit quieter, I think. So, let's just bring it back up again. Okay. So again, that one's probably a little bit loud. So let's get it to the right volume. And then I'm going to use shift and push that up to the top. Um, so I think that's pretty much it for the touch strip. Okay.